thank you all for coming. It is a, a great honor and rather humbling to hear your name mentioned so many times by so many politicians. Um, it, actually, in the US, that would be a very scary thing. Uh, I do not normally speak from a script, but these are important topics and it's worth taking care to ensure language issues don't get in the way of the conversation. And frankly, it is much more useful when you are so jet lagged that you have to make sure that you make sense of what you're saying. Uh, I've taken to try and summarize my talks in the form of a tweet. So for those of you who have to leave early, you're done. Um, it's also because I have a president from the United States who might read it, and that's about the attention span that I can expect. So <laughs> it's good to see that the translation's working. Librarians transform communities by weaving together the brilliance of its people. The result is called a library. As I talk today and I move through this, one of the things I want you to remember is as we talk about making a difference, and what I've heard is very much a plan to make a positive difference, it is ultimately people that we are seeking to affect, and it is people that will make that difference. This building, this room, these institutions, what we call a library, they're a collection of individuals. And we must support those individuals and understand that it is the action of all of us that is important. So, let me begin by thanking the conference organizers for having me. I have fallen in love with Italy. This is my first visit to Umbria, and any chance I get to explore more of this wonderful country is most appreciated. Part of the reason I love my time in Italy is well represented today's agenda, culture, health, innovation, economic development. You see these forces in work in the streets of Italy's cities, both new and ancient. Within minutes, I can walk from 15th century reading rooms to water-cooled data centers. On trains, I watch the countryside flash by olive groves and supercar manufacturers. In a nation of constant evolution where history and future are always in conversation. I think that's something that I just take a, a quick moment on. We look at history and we look at and we talk about the future, but really it's a constant dialogue about how we define our present. What do we look back to and what are we inspired by and what do we aspire to become? That ongoing document, that living conversation with what's gone in the past and what we want to aspire in the future, to me that's cultural heritage. The rooms and the buildings and the materials, those are the result of a culture, of a language, of a people trying to make sense of their world. And even when we look back at history, we don't preserve it, we interpret it on a regular basis. And a lot of our education and a lot of our work is how do we understand that past and how do we value it against where we're going. So, today I want to talk about libraries, but more importantly, I want to talk about libraries in a new way. Not as an institution or collection, but as a platform for weaving together and proactively working to define and then fulfilling community aspirations. I have seen libraries serve as engines of economic development, fostering communities of entrepreneurs and small business. I've seen libraries embrace the neediest members of a community and act as a social safety net, integrating the refugee, the homeless, and the poor back into a larger, kinder community. I've seen libraries serve as the universities of the people, increasing literacy rates, improving workforce development for industry, and supporting students online. I've seen libraries crack open treasure troves of cultural heritage and history to a new generation, inspiring the arts and science alike. I've seen libraries step forward and become the only truly functional local government against and amongst partisan bickering. All of these libraries had something in common. Um, by the way, I, I point out that over here you will see uh, from the Libraries Transform program, these are several of the different slides and posters that they put out. All of the, these are going to be actually around public health and how libraries interact with public health. And that Libraries Transform campaign is very much in my mind. So all the libraries that seek to transform and have this effect on community have 
uh, several things in common. First, a dedicated core of professionals that proactively engage their communities. The second is a proactive agenda, much of what we just heard, where they've worked across all sectors of a community to develop a common narrative and a common mission for the community. All of these libraries that made a difference shared an underlying philosophy based on knowledge and people making meaning in their lives, not information, not books, or a focus on tools of learning. Lastly, all see the library not as a place, or as a collection, but as a platform, a system of systems the, that knitted together community expertise. In essence, these librarians understand that the true collection of a library is the community served, not the books and tools that were used in that service. I listened with great interest in the DigiPass and the great service that we were providing by getting people access. I'm guessing the goal of that project was not bandwidth but connecting people and unleashing the possibilities of people. Right? That's the point. All too often in libraries and in many different sectors, we confuse our tools with our purpose. In medicine, it would be like saying defining a surgeon by their scalpel. Right? The scalpel alone is not going to heal you. In fact, scalpel in the wrong hand is going to do a lot of damage. It's the expertise of the doctor that matters. So let me take these in turn. I begin with that dedicated core of professional librarians. Too many people define a librarian as a person who works in a library. I do not. I see libraries as things created and maintained by librarians. Now, I have a broader definition of a librarian than most. Librarians are defined by their mission, their methods, and their values. The mission of librarians is to improve society through facilitating knowledge creation in their communities. It is not a, to house or hoard books. Though they may build collections in the realization of their mission, it is not to catalog, though they certainly have those skills of classification and metadata. No, the first important part of defining a library is to realize that it is not what a librarian does that defines them, Rather, it is why they do it. What you need in your communities, your villages, your towns, your cities, is not a worker, but a missionary. A, literally, a person on a mission. A missionary that is focused on helping their communities make smarter decisions through knowledge creation. Let me simplify that. Through learning. The mission of a librarian is to help communities make smarter decisions, whether it's in how they spend their taxes, whether it's in how they educate their young, whether it's in how they deal with the fact that it's the seniors that deal with 75, 65 percent of the money spent in higher education, in how we allocate our time. And what do these library missionaries do? How do they facilitate learning? That's the second part of defining a librarian. They facilitate learning not in a classroom and not restricted to a grade level, but they help people learn. They help people learn through books and online. They facilitate learning through nonfiction and fiction. They provide the motivation, access, knowledge, and environment to members of a community that seek to make meaning in their lives and improve their stations in life. As human beings, we are naturally curious. We naturally seek to understand what is our part and place in the world. To do that, we learn. We constantly engage in change. Maybe that's learning about new stories and new opportunities. Maybe that's learning about new jobs. Maybe it's simply learning about what they enjoy, what they want to spend their time on. For example, nonfiction, we think of that as something that we learn from, but fiction. The narratives, the stories of other times and other cultures help us to appreciate what's possible. We've seen in many nations where women's rights are often put to the side, that true social change comes from when young girls and women can engage in the stories from other cultures and other life that demonstrate what is possible and what is capable. And through that belief, that understanding, that release, through fiction, through understanding, they have changed the entire society of which they are a part. We've seen this again in people of different races and different creeds. That's the power that libraries can bring 
When we talk about reading, reading is a necessary function, but it's necessary to what? It's necessary to expanding and changing how we view the world. And we have to understand that to embrace reading, to be part of reading, we must first understand what it is that people are trying to do with that. I, there's a story um, told of a library that was having a session where they were teaching parents how to do storytelling. So they had a book. That they were, and, and what happened was the, the librarian, the, the literacy teacher, sat on a stage, had their own child there, and they read a book. They demonstrated it. At the end, one mother with a young infant in her arms came up to that, to that literacy expert and said, on this page, what did you say on this page? And on that page, what did you say on that page? And the literacy expert was trying to figure out why so detailed, why page by page. And she finally realized the mother couldn't read. The mother couldn't read, but she knew that reading was so essential to her child and the opportunities that her child would have that she was going to memorize every step in that book. It was then the library that determined and turned around and said, that's wonderful but we're going to teach you how to read because you deserve that as well. Reading is that power, is that learning, and that's what libraries are about. The last component to define a librarian is the values they live by in their work. Librarians facilitate learning in an open way. They seek to create safe places to explore dangerous ideas. They value and respect diversity, diversity in race, creed, and viewpoints. They believe in, intellectually honest, in intellectual honesty and rationalism, and they seek to support decisions with evidence, something that we could use a lot more of. So the first ingredient for bringing our communities together is and pushing them forward, because that's the other thing that may not be evident here. Those professional librarians are not passive in this act. They are not unbiased. They are not neutral parties waiting for someone to walk into their doors to help. They're proactive. They go out and help define what is the agenda, what is the community. They push communities. They seek to engage in conversation because the librarians are part of that community. They have a say. They have a stake. An improved community means an improved life for the library, means an improved life of the library, it means improved situation to be in. We have a voice, and we must explore it and use it. The second thing that these libraries that seek to transform as agents of positive change in a is a community-held agenda. A library, no matter how capable the librarians that run it, cannot improve the community alone, which I think is the theme of today, done beautifully. Librarians must seek to bring together communities to develop a common agenda and plan. Libraries, hospitals, town halls, police, schools, businesses must come together and set priorities and goals. Is your town a healthy town, a, a historic place, a center of business? In Columbia, South Carolina, where I now live, the Richland Library took well over a year to develop its strategic plan. It took that long because it wasn't a conversation just of the library staff. The library met with mayors, police, school teachers, and community elders. They didn't ask what the library should do, because frankly, people don't know, because they don't expect enough from us, and it's not their job to figure that out. It's our job to figure out what the library should do to respond and support the community. Instead, they asked what the community as a whole wanted to accomplish. The final plan has things you would guess, ways to improve services, ways to improve staff. However, there's an entire section of the plan devoted to community goals. The Richland Library had, as part of its strategic plan, oops, excuse me, It's always bad when your speech disappears. Um, has part of its community plan. Here we go, it's coming. Those things. Uh, <laughs> help create a strong and resilient economy. That the library's strategic plan said that the library was a component of improving the economy. To strengthen community cohesion. 
to transform educational outcomes for youth and to help break the cycle of poverty. Now, the library wasn't going to achieve these goals alone. They were going to do it with schools and police and community welfare, welfare organizations. What is Umbria's strategic plan? What is your town's narrative? What is it that when people come and visit your library, your village, your town, your city, what do you want them to walk away and know? In Topeka, Kansas, the public library teamed with charities on their plans to incl that included having all children ready for school. Easy to say. We want all children ready for their first grade in school. They put together literacy efforts, tutoring, and a host of services. When they discovered that the neediest children couldn't physically get to the library, they worked with bus companies to provide transportation. When that wasn't enough, they trained first their own librarians and then a host of community volunteers to leave the library and go into the homes of the families. They sought to make a change. They didn't seek to improve people coming into the library or the quality of the collection. They sought to improve the quality of life. And in order to do that, they had to get out of the building. As we embrace our communities, as we embrace knowledge, we must realize that the buildings that we build, these lovely estates, are not for us anymore. It's not a place for us to do our work. It's for the community to do their work. And increasingly, as we can walk around with these things on us, we can do our work anywhere. In refugee camps, in city centers, on football fields. Every day we can be doing the work of librarians and allow them to use this space when they need a common place to come together. In Casanova, New York, librarians went into food shelters to deliver services. They worked with parents to finish secondary school and get them into jobs. During the graduation ceremony of the program, the director of the library, Betsy Kennedy, was giving out new books to children. We taught them reading, let's give them a new book. As she was giving out these books, a young girl, eight, nine years old, began to cry. Betsy Kennedy worried, she said, what's wrong? And the girl looked at her and said, this is the first new thing I have ever owned. What the library had accomplished was, yes, literacy, but more than that, they had accomplished a sense of value and worth in someone who, to that point, had always felt worthless. You want to talk about cultural heritage. The heritage of a culture is in how it treats its most vulnerable parts. The heritage, the thing we leave to tomorrow, the culture that we seek to create to create that tomorrow, is done person to person, conversation to conversation, life to life. That is then the second ingredient to preparing transformational libraries. Libraries that can transform communities and individuals is a proactive agenda. More than just an agenda, it is a plan based on the aspirations and dreams of your community. Stop focusing on the deficits of your community. Stop defining people by their shortcomings and needs and start seeing communities as dreams and possibilities. Betsy Kennedy didn't go into that food shelter because people were hungry and couldn't read. She went in because she knew that citizens who were fed and could read would contribute powerfully to her community. She didn't go in because they were hungry. She went in to make sure that they were fed so they could contribute. The third component to transformational libraries is seeing the core of librarianship as focused on knowledge, not information or books. While not as concrete as the training of librarians or the development of community-wide strategic plans, <coughs> excuse me, changing the core concepts around information is essential. <coughs> Oh, grazie. How you see the foundations of your work changes what you measure, <clears throat> what you value, and ultimately what you do. <clears throat> we see this in public health. A focus on disease when replaced by a focus on health 
has dramatically changed public policy. Payments for treatments become investments in wellness visits. Vaccination replaces acute care. Stopping people smoking becomes a priority over expanding cancer treatment programs. <clears throat> the same kind of fundamental change can be seen in education. Replacing an industrial model of standardized education gives way to experiential learning, independent education, and the development of critical thinking skills. One fundamental concept has had dramatic changes on health, education, libraries, and indeed just about every sector of the economy, and that has been a focus on information. In, polit in political science, we no longer talk about power bases, but instead information processing. In commerce, we've shifted from market to data analysis. The rise of big data and analytics in all aspects of our lives has fundamentally changed how we see and interact with each other. It has led to governments seeing people as customers versus citizens. We see communities as graphs and hope for predictive algorithms to optimize services. <clears throat> to be sure, information technology and information science has had amazing benefits in our lives. However, an information view has a tendency to focus on things that are quantifiable. They see people only in relation to their use of a system and flatten rich concepts of impact and meaning to simple concepts of access. Take a simple example. Few would argue that access to the internet is increasingly important for citizens. Yet, this is often only defined as getting citizens online. We look to provide broadband and fiber connections to rural populations. In our cities, we look to smartphones and wireless networks to connect people. How many of these projects assume that access to the internet is the same as being able to improve one's life through connection? Do citizens have the training to use the internet? Can they create their own presence on the net? Or have we merely provided them with a way to consume more information in walled gardens of companies that make money on the privacy of our communities. I was very heartened to hear about the facilitators and training that will be in this facility because it shows that it's not enough to say, here, you have a connection, your life is better. It's not enough. In the rural state, I live in a rural state. South Carolina is a rural state. The state government has been connecting small towns and schools through the country, throughout the countryside. The thought is that once students can access the internet, they will improve their learning and their prospects for the future. This connectivity has been met with a push for moving government services online. This includes providing textbooks and learning materials. Many students are now required to do schoolwork online. However, too many students don't have access at home. So now school districts are transforming school buses into mobile hotspots so that students can do their work on the bus. A bus ride in, that in some cases takes hours to get from a child from home to school and back again. The student has access now. But has the government improved the opportunities for that child? Has the child been trained in using the internet to not only study, but create and communicate? Has the child been informed that access on smartphones and tablets, the technologies deployed in these schools, can't be used to create new apps or software? Simply having one of these to access is great, but this is all built around you playing games and watching things. You can't make the next killer app with a phone. And so to say people are connected doesn't mean that we've empowered them in the new economy. That same belief that, aspect, that access, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Has anyone taken into account that we are training students to give up socialization for consuming things online and not preparing them to be authors of their own future? What do they do with that time that used to be in talking and connecting and learning about their neighbors is now spent looking at an iPad and getting work done because they don't have access at home? The same belief that access is impact and that learning is the same as informing will hold back your libraries from realizing the true potential of their communities. If you are satisfied that your libraries give access to books and documents from others, then you are limiting their potential. Libraries are about knowledge, not information. 
They are about creating an engagement, not consumption and distribution. If you want your library to be agents of positive transformation in Umbria, they need to be populated not just with books, but with musical instruments, classes, tools, and tools for creation. The world of tomorrow belongs to the economy that creates and invents, not consumes and repackages. Tomorrow's Apples and Googles and Amazons will come from the minds of the creative learner, not the informed consumer. We are human, and so we find meaning and place in this world through knowledge and learning. That learning happens in engaged conversations with our peers, but most importantly with ourselves. If you want a healthier community, you invest in building peer pressure around healthy habits. Having a spouse who doesn't smoke is infinitely more effective than a poster or brochure on the dangers of tobacco. Your libraries in hospitals, in government, in the public, in universities must be focused on connection development and over collection development. On my first trip to Italy, a librarian told me the difference between public libraries in the US and in Italy. In the US, he said, you collect cookbooks. In Italy, your mother teaches you how to cook. Then I say, Make your mother part of the library. I was very, um, by the way, rewarded many years later when I went into the San Giorgio Library in Pistoia and saw a huge collection of cookbooks. But that's another issue. Okay. In Pistoia, the library is filled not with just books, but with community members sharing what they know. You can read a book, but you can also sit down with a blacksmith. In libraries across Europe, you can check out books and engineers and bankers and professors. Our third ingredient for transformational libraries is then an attitude. It is a worldview that says we will use information as a tool to our real aim, a better life. We will never mistake data analysis for insight or books for knowledge. Knowledge and learning are passionate human things. The Renaissance, centuries ago, was about the birth of humanism and the power of the individual in the universe. Let us not make our legacy the replacing of the human with the algorithm or the decimal point. Data science is a set of amazingly powerful tools, as are books, but they are still just tools to our ultimate goal, not a replacement. And so we come to our last ingredient. This one is really the result of the first three. It is building and running a library as a platform, a system of systems. Many think of the library as a single function, collection building. However, libraries have always been a set of functions. Even in the most traditional view of libraries, they collected, organized, circulated, and found materials. However, these functions rarely made their appearance outside of a single place or organization. What transformational libraries see is that the library is a platform, a system of systems for the community to determine their own outcomes and to do their own work. Librarians and libraries, they build and maintain and collect. They aggregate money from taxes or tuition or overhead and purchase shared resources. Those can be books. But in Ann Arbor, Michigan, it is musical instruments. And that citizens can, learn, can use and learn to produce their own music. Librarians can lease databases or pool real estate and provide entrepreneurs with co-working spaces. Libraries can collect the writing of the community and publish them to the world. Libraries organize materials, but they can also organize events, workshops, professional development, and whole curricula. Libraries circulate fishing rods to sportsmen to support local economies. Librarians provide massive bandwidth to software engineers that want to telecommute to work. Libraries have partnered with local news outlets to create archives and organize citizen journalists. They have also used their organizational skills to coordinate teams of citizen science, scientists in genetics and zoological research. There is a very good chance that the next breakthrough in cancer treatment will come from communities spending time on their computers folding proteins as a game. 
not necessarily from a researcher with a PhD locked in a laboratory. Transformational libraries take millennia of skills and experience and now provide those as services to the whole community. They team with hospitals to create community health answering services. They team with emergency management to provide trusted and safe places in times of tragedy. Two years ago in Columbia, South Carolina, right before I moved, they had what was called a thousand year flood. It rained for days and days and days and one dam gave way and led to the other dam giving way and soon the streets of Columbia were under feet of water. Water topped over the water treatment so no longer was there available clean water to drink and there was now sewage in the streets. People would kayak, would boat down the streets to work and find that their work was now ruined. When FEMA, that's the United States Emergency Management Agency, showed up to help rebuild lives, to give out support, they set up in libraries. People who were out of their homes would go to libraries to recharge their phones so that their parents, their neighbors, their children could know that they were all right. They bookmobiles, they took the books out and they filled them full of water and they filled them full of provisions and they drove around the cities and the streets to give out and support people. Librarians did this even when their own homes were destroyed because that is part of their mission. They do these things because they are based on the core skills of librarianship and as importantly because it is part of their mission to improve society. At this point, let me make one thing clear. I have been using examples from the United States. However, I could easily pull examples from throughout Europe and Africa and Asia. I could talk about the Frisk Lab in the Netherlands bringing coding and making skills to students in rural schools. Or I could talk about the community outreach in Liverpool and Cologne, as I have done in Pistoia. So there are my four ingredients for the transformation of libraries. A dedicated core of professionals, a proactive agenda of community improvement, a foundation in learning and knowledge, a view of the library as a platform. But what is missing is the big question. Why libraries in the first place? Couldn't a school play this role? Don't many of the ministries represented here today already serve these roles? The answer is that schools, ministries, and businesses, and churches, and charities all play an important role in the vision of an engaged community. However, in many places, the library is the last institution that stretches to all boundaries of the community. Public libraries stretch from early literacy activities to end-of-life decisions. Academic libraries serve classics departments and physics departments. What's more, libraries are institutions that interact with these diverse communities in knowledge. Police certainly serve the whole community and seek to improve society, but it's not necessarily where we want our teenagers to hang out. Likewise, our schools are for children. Our universities are for scholars. Libraries connect them all. They provide the last piazza community square. Libraries can be the place that connects ministries and schools and commerce and faith systems together to people seeking to make meaning in their lives. In his excellent book, Sapiens, historian uh, Yuval Harari talks about the origins of the scientific revolution and the ascendancy of Western Europe in global history, or as he calls it, that out of the way obscure northern west part of Europe. Um, interesting book. Um, he points out that the key to moving forward was actually a wide-scale acceptance of ignorance. Up until the Renaissance and later the Enlightenment, there was a common belief that all that needed to be known was known. Wise men and great ancient texts, holy texts, understood, and if it wasn't answered by these, then it didn't matter. If the answer couldn't be found in the Quran or the Bible or the Torah, or it couldn't be how, didn't be known by the expert, clearly it wasn't important enough. God would have mentioned it. This led to a wide-scale belief that the best of days were actually behind us. This idea was brought to me as I toured of the Roman ruins of Europe. 
here were people that during the so-called dark ages literally lived in the shadow of former accomplishment. And how could you not feel the best days were behind you when you were trying to eke out a living amongst grand columns and marble facades? And you didn't know how that stonework was done or how they could have ever made that building so tall. Harari says that until society accepted that there were things that were not known and yet were still important, they couldn't accept and explore and discover new knowledge. Cells, atoms, planetary systems, gravity, algebra were not in the Bible but could advance man's understanding of the universe. Medicine, electronics, industry came when we saw the past not as a place for emulation or lost greatness, but as a foundation to move forward. To be sure, the results were not always good or humane or equitable, but it has engendered within our culture optimism and aspiration. Who doesn't feel that next year that piece of technology will be slightly better? That I can do a slightly better job? That there's always something better in the future? That idea of growth comes from the first accepting that we don't know everything, but we can try and figure it out. I am asking you to unleash your libraries and librarians. I am asking you to both equip and obligate librarians with living up to their full potential. Free the librarians from the stacks. Set them loose throughout Umbria with a mission to connect our communities and institutions. Set them on the path of uncovering the aspirations of every citizen and refugee and connecting those to your resources and capabilities. Tell librarians you want your libraries filled with students and blacksmiths and entrepreneurs and doctors and teachers not to consume but to invent the future of the state, the country, the continent, and indeed the world. I believe that you have the foundations for truly taking libraries and creating the new renaissance here, to create an ability that sets forth the brilliance of your community. As we said in that introductory tweet, the power of libraries, the power of librarians, your power, your obligation is to weave together the brilliance of your own community, a community that has doctors and scientists and plumbers and craftspeople and mothers and cooks. And the result of weaving together that brilliance, that's what we call a library. Thank you very much.